Once we prove this result, let me show you where we're going to be going, okay? We're going to have a result which is very, very concise, and there are two main applications that we're going to explore in, um, this is probably worth jotting you down, in 14F of the Year 11 textbook. There are two main applications, one of them is pure, and the other one is, can anyone tell me what the other big branch of mathematics is apart from pure? Wow, we're really asleep this morning. Okay, when we do maths for its own sake, that's called pure maths. It's like we're not trying to solve any problems. We're just like playing around with maths and see what happens, right? But the other kind of maths is where you're trying to solve a problem. It's applied to a specific context and it's called applied. Thank you very much. So there are some pure problems that we can solve with this result I'm going to show you. There are some applied problems we can solve. Um, but interestingly, and actually this is often the case, it's going to be the pure result that becomes more interesting to us because it's going to take us into calculus of trigonometric functions, okay? So we're going to focus on those top two because that's where you need to sort of bed things down before you get into calculus, but this is just so you know where the trajectory is headed. So hopefully by now I've stalled a little bit and you have drawn for you a, uh, a sector and I've got a triangle within that. And because this is a sector, it's part of a circle, right? That's um, one of the signals to you that even though I'm doing trigonometry as a whole, I'm working with these angles, right? But the angles are not just going to be in any form. It's within the context of a circle. So when you see circles and you see angles, which form of angle are you going to use? Which method of measuring? Are you going to use degrees? You're going to try and get away from degrees as much as you possibly can. Sometimes you can't. But because this is a circle, that should indicate to you that everything we're about to do is in radians, okay? And that's actually very important later on because when we start doing calculus of the trigonometric function, one of the key things is, hey, we're doing this all in radians, and you'll think, why? Why are we doing this? It's some arbitrary thing. Well, all the results on which calculus of trig functions depend, we're about to do this morning. And because they're based on radians, everything following this is also going to be radians. Okay, now you guys know in maths, frequently, we gain knowledge from looking at a single object from more than one perspective, okay? Um, think back to, good morning, take a seat. Uh, think back to auxiliary angle. You guys already covered auxiliary angle, right? Yeah, so the whole idea is if I give you a function that is the sum of two other trigonometric functions, you can write it in a new form. You can say, okay, I'm going to have a new wave function out of these two. It's gonna have a different amplitude and it's also going to have a different, what's the other thing that's going to change? So I don't know. It starts with a P. Have you guys learned this word yet? Phase. It's going to have a different phase. Thank you very much, right? So when you take your wave function, it's the same wave function, same amplitude, but if you shift it along horizontally, we call that the phase, right? Now, these are the two same thing. They're the same object, right? But we like this because you're like, oh, single trig function, I can deal with this much easier. So you've got the same object, looked at from two different angles, and you gain insight, right? And we're going to do exactly the same thing this in this, within this diagram. And you can see the object I'm interested in because I've highlighted it with color, right? This, um, this H here is what we're interested in, and we're going to look at it from two very simple perspectives and therefore gain some information out of this. Now, I've deliberately left some stuff off here which I want you to add along with me, okay? To get at this H over here, to look at it from two different perspectives, I want to focus on this guy down here. See this little length between our vertical length and our arc over here. Um, this guy's going to be important, so we're going to call him x, right? That little length is x. Now, because along the bottom here, this is the edge of a sector, right? If this is x, what does this remaining length end up being? R uh, minus x, right? It's just that difference there. Okay, so far so good. I've done all my setup. Now I'm ready to actually understand this thing. That red object there? It exists in a right angle triangle, and I know that angle that's subtended at the center of this big circle of which I haven't drawn the whole thing. So therefore, I can state H in terms of, well, in terms of a variety of trig functions. I've got three to choose from, but I'm actually going to be, for reasons clear in about 10 minutes, I'm only going to focus on sine and tan. Can someone tell me what statement can I make with H that has sine in it? I'll give you a clue. It starts with sine. <laughs> tell me what I can write next. You've only got one angle in this triangle, right? So maybe I should take sine of? Theta. theta. Wow. It's almost as if I've given you information that leans you in this particular direction. In this right angle triangle, sine theta, of course, is equal to? Opposite on hypotenuse. Okay. Now, this is true, but remember I told you the object I'm really focusing on is actually that H, right? So I'm going to change the subject here, and I get H equals R sine theta out of that. Are you so far so good? Okay. So I have a statement for the length of h, but that's not the only perspective from which I can look. 
I'm going to write a statement with tan in it. I'm going to give you a second. You go ahead. You write it down. I'm not going to do it together. You guys can work this part out. Okay, Chester, what do we got? Um, equals to h over r minus x. Okay, h on r minus x, opposite on adjacent, or fine. But again, remember the thing I'm really interested in is h, so I'm going to change that to be the subject, and this is what I get. Okay, now, nothing particularly groundbreaking so far, but you notice that I have the same length, h, and stated in two different ways, so I can actually equate those, right? I can say, therefore, r sine theta and r minus x tan theta these are the same thing, just looked at in two different ways. Okay, now, why would I bother doing this? Well, see my diagram, see how it's so comically large, right? The reason it's comically large is because I use this meter rule for this very specific reason, okay? And if you've got your ruler there also, I'm going to pop it down here. I'm going to pop it down the end here just so you can see all my... Actually, no, I'll put it on the top. You can still see my x and my r minus x there. There we go. There's one. There's my radius in yellow, and then here's my other radius. Now. What I've got here, no, I am going to have to put it lower. What I've got here, that's better, are these two radii. And I'm interested in what happens when the angle gets smaller, hence the heading, small angle approximations. Okay? So as theta gets smaller, as it shrinks down, okay, this radius is not going to be up here anymore. It's going to be at spots like, say, that. There we go. That'll do me. Okay. Now, can you see, as theta gets smaller, like this is like theta, which is like half the length. Okay? What's going to happen is this H is going to change, isn't it? Its position has changed entirely. It's going to be moved over here to the right. So it's going to be like so. You might like to put this in as well. Okay. I've got a new H, but along with that new H, I also have a new X. Where is X in this diagram? Have a look. Where would you place it? It's just like teeny tiny little length over here, right? And that's actually very important that it's getting teeny tiny, this new x over here. You can see as theta gets smaller, as I move this radius down even further, let's go down like this. In fact, at this point here, I'm going to draw one more and probably on your diagram, you'll not have much space to do any further than that, like that. As theta gets smaller, what's happening to x? It's just vanishing away, right? As theta disappears, at theta approaches zero, so does x. So I have a way of stating this, right? Wrong color. I can say, using my language of limits, right? I can say, but the limit as theta approaches zero of that length, x, what is that limit? What's it approaching? What do we just establish? Also approaching zero, right? So therefore, if I think about this in the context of this statement that we just made over here about H, right? We've forgotten that it was about H. We don't need to know that that's where it came from, but that's where we learned this, right? Just simple right angle triangle tree. I can take the limit of both sides here as theta, as theta approaches zero, right? In other words, for small values of theta, this is what happens when theta is approaching zero. We say it, they're getting little, right? I'm going to have R sine theta on the left hand side. What's going to happen over here? What's happening to that X? We just established this, right? That x is just vanishing away, it's just disappearing, right? So these things are going to become equal to each other without that x. You see what happened? That was like r minus 0 and it's just vanishing away, okay? Now, you can see here r is just the length of any description, so I can divide both sides through by r, so I'm getting this. Like so, okay? Now, Sine theta and tan theta, what are we saying? As theta gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the difference between them is really this x. And that's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. You can see uh, that these things are approaching each other for small values of theta. What does sine theta actually approach when theta gets small? Think about the graph. What does, theta, sorry, what does sine theta approach when theta itself gets small? It also approaches zero. If you have a look at the graph there, right? As theta approaches zero, as it gets closer and closer into the origin, right? Do you see that theta is getting to zero? So is sine theta, right? What about tan? This tan approach. When you are getting closer to zero. Same thing, right? Here's the graph. 
actually not interested in this part over here, but this is so you recognize it as tan. And as you can see, as theta gets closer and closer to zero in this little territory in there, right, you can see tan is getting closer and closer to zero. In other words, theta and sine and tan, they're all approaching zero. Does this make sense? Okay, so what we can state is, in summary, for small values of theta, sine theta and theta and tan theta are all basically the same thing. This is the small angle approximation after which this entire idea is named. For small angles, we can approximate these things as all basically equal to each other. 